Hello and welcome to the Open Era Podcast. My name is Devang Desai. Simon and I are off this week as we get ready for the North American Hardcore Swing, including a stop in Toronto, where we'll be doing some cool stuff, so stay tuned for that. But for this week, we're going to look back at 2009 in the Australian Open, not the final between Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal that produced those waterworks from Fed that we remember so well. No, we're going to look back at the semifinal between Fernando Verdasco and Rafa. Five hours and 14 minutes of brilliance. Verdasco arguably reaching the pinnacle of his career at that point, and yet it came in a semifinal loss. We had Racket Magazine and the defectors, Geary Nathan, join us to relive this Rod Laver Arena masterpiece. So join us on this open era look back. We look forward to talking to you soon. Hello and welcome to the Open Air Podcast. My name is Devang Desai and I'm joined as always by Mr. Simon Bushel. Bush, how goes it, sir? It is going very well, Devang. It is uh, fully summer here in Vancouver now. We've reached the pinnacle of the height of the summer, so uh, it's only downhill from here, I think. Very nice. In keeping this podcast transcontinental, we decided to go to New York for our guest this episode. He's a contributing editor at the Racket Magazine and you've seen his work at Deadspin, among many other places. It's Geary Nathan. How's it going? It's good. Thanks for having me. For this week's match, we again went to our user submission for the pick. Hey, fellas. My name is Dmitry Filipovich, and my recommendation for today's Tennis Rewatchable is the 2009 Aussie Open Classic between Rafa Nadal and Fernando Verdasco. Uh, it's not my first choice. Honestly, I tried to slip at least a solid 10 Novak Djokovic matches by Devang, but he was swatting them all away and rebuffed every single one of them. And so eventually we settled on this one. And I think it's checks a lot of the boxes. It's a personal favorite for me personally, because I remember being in high school and staying up to like 5 a.m. to watch it live and then not being able to function the next morning in class. But beyond that personal appeal, I think it's got sort of widespread appeal for everyone because it checks so many boxes. It's a slam semi, so it's got the stakes. It's got the back and forth element with the two of them trading sets. And the way I remember it in my head is the tennis itself is, is world class and both guys were playing at a supremely high level. So hopefully it uh, still holds up all these years later and you guys enjoy. And normally I'd apologize for nominating a match that'll take you a solid five hours to get through, but let's be real. It's not like any of us have anything better to do these days. So Gary, I'm curious where are you on the Rafael Nadal fan spectrum? Are you a super fan? Are you respect his game type person, or are you or are you not not down with the Nadal experience? Uh, I think it's definitely transformed as I've aged and matured. Like as a preteen teenager Fed fan, like you just don't really have the maturity or perspective to uh, <laughs> appreciate it, appreciate him. Um, but I think as I, as I've you know become less kind of stubbornly and foolishly attached to any one player and it's trying to appreciate how lucky we are to watch you know the three best do it at the same time i've come around and i just, i appreciate the nuances of it more than when I, I i honestly remember conversations i had when i was in middle school talking to my friends about how rafa is a pusher which is just like <laughs> i think i've come a long way from from that <laughs> You're talking about uh, evolution and, and growing. We're trying to do that ourselves, sir, because you've joined two <laughs> Fed recovering Fedaholics who could not see the greater things in Rafa's game either. And Bush and I were joking. I don't think we've, we have done a look back in which Rafa has won the match. Every time we go back, it's an adult wow. loss. So we had to write we had to write that wrong. But Bush, I guess, where is Rafa at this point? We go to 2009, we go to the Australian Open. It's the start of the year. And basically, we've had a, a seismic shift in the tennis world with what happened at Wimbledon, of course, in 2008. Definitely, yeah. This is the point in time where Rafa Nadal has, has conquered the demon. He's at the top of the top of the world rankings. He's top of the mountain, um, obviously losing to Federer 
in uh, at Wimbledon and consecutive years, and then finally coming back and winning in 2008 in that infamous final. But yeah, he's world number one here. And going into the Australian Open, I think the narrative around him at this point is whether or not he's going to be able to complete the career Grand Slam. He's obviously won in Paris on several occasions here. He's still not lost a match in Paris when we join him here, which is very entertaining. And he's won at Wimbledon, but his record... At the Australian Open, is still fairly patchy. He made the semi-final of the year previously in 2008. So I guess looking at this one, it's, is he going to take that next step? Is he going to cement his world number one ranking? And is he going to be able to claim his first Grand Slam in Australia? It's interesting. I mean, he's obviously extremely successful on the clay courts and he has that breakthrough at Wimbledon, but there is still a question about where Rafa can go on the hard courts. And and this is a different hard court. I think it's worth mentioning. I think we've been on the record boats talking about how the Australian Open is probably our favorite major. And there's a reason that a lot of the matches we do take place there. But this court is crazy slow. And, and you could see it throughout the tournament heading into the semifinal. Yeah, undoubtedly. And I think it's no surprise that they made the decisions to speed up that court, given what's happened. I think it's... If you look at this semi-final and then what happens between the final Rafael Nadal and, and Novak Djokovic, given the fact that they nearly killed both players at the end of that match, it's, it's no surprise with the direction they went in it. I think maybe we could point directions and fingers uh, maybe at the US Open and the USTA to try and encourage them to maybe do something about some of the long matches we've seen in uh, in New York as well. And I suspect Kiri will probably have some opinions about this one as well. But yes, <laughs> this is at a time when the court is still monumentally slow. It's like playing on on uh, wet cement levels of slow this court is. I, I definitely agree on the court speed. One thing that jumped out at me visually is how far into the court that Verdasco is standing. And this is like 2009 Rafa Nadal. So a lot of this just has to be the court surface, the ball you know, sitting up a little bit and allowing him to, to get you know, two, three, four feet into the baseline, um, which just feels, you know, it's, it's clear why this match lasted as long as it did. <laughs> they brought, they, they might as well have shipped the clay over from Paris to Melbourne and then just put it over this, this surface because it was ridiculous. And Verdasco is young here. He, the, the world is his oyster, quote unquote, but this is literally the peak of Fernando Verdasco's career in terms of Grand Slams and his path to the final. I mean, there is some signature wins here in, in like, Andy Murray at this time, obviously, especially in Australia. Joe Willie Sanga at that time in Australia. Two guys who have found a ton of success there. He dispatched them. And the doll just bludgeoning a, a who's who of the past decade of tennis, if you're talking names. Olivier Rokas, you know that name. That is remembering a guy. <laughs> Karusinich, Tommy Haas, Fernando, Fernando Gonzalez, Jill Simon. He's in the semifinal. I'm making this claim, fellas, and you tell me if I'm way off here, because this is before I think Stan really came around, right? Is this the best match to capture what the golden age of tennis meant that didn't feature two members of the big four? Is that fair to say? Because I think you see a lot of the elements that would go on to make up this next era of tennis that we're still living in. Bush, what do you think? Uh, Probably. Yeah, I think so. I think that's probably a fair thing to say, Um, given... Given Vadasco's performance in this semifinal, I think you're probably accurate on that one. Yeah, I think one of my main takeaways from watching this match is that this is just probably the highest level of tennis period, um, you know, big four or otherwise. I think maybe starting around here and going another three or four years, um, the level of competition from guys like Sanga, uh, you know, Burdich, Murray's obviously coming in. So it's... I think this is just some of the best shot making and athleticism that that tennis has ever seen starts around 2009. And the biggest question I have before we start with the match, do you think these guys are actually friends? Because I did some analysis into this, some deep analysis and I've, you know, Rafa is pretty, like he hangs out with Mark Lopez a lot, obviously, but like, you know who his crew is on tour in terms, in terms of the Spaniards? And for that, and Verdasco was never part of that. And during this match, you can kind of see, yeah. obviously the emotions are high, but there's, there's some moments, there's some moments of, of heated anger exchange. And I'm curious if you guys think, or are on the same page with me by saying, I don't think this relationship ever recovered after this match specifically. My impression is that Verdasco is not the most likable guy in general. <laughs> and I, 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 it's very hard for me to pinpoint a few incidents. I mean, I know, I know there was that one blow up in Miami a couple of years back, but it just, 
he just seems like generally this irritable and sort of unpredictable guy. And so I, I would not be surprised to learn that he and Rafa were not exactly boys leading up to this match. I do think there's a certain amount of it, which is we see the fiery Rafael Rafa Nadal on court, but away from the court, he is a little more placid. He is a little bit more laid back. He does like the quiet life. And you look and see that he has been with his girlfriend for a very long time. He enjoys very much tranquility and uh, he still lives in the place that he was born in as well. And there has to be a certain amount of things in this one, which is just that he crushed Vadasco his entire career. And... <laughs> Velasco never got close to him, really, aside one signature win that he had against him in 2016, again at the Australian Open, which I'm sure we'll come back to. But outside of that, he goes into this match and Velasco has never beaten him. And Nadal crushed him in Paris as well, not that, not that many months before the Australian Open here where they met in the semi-final. So it's got to be hard. I'm sure when you are around someone who is a, a compatriot from your home country and you get talked about in the same breath, oftentimes in the same news cycle about who is in the tennis world. But Asko wasn't in that narrative at all. Rafael Nadal is Spanish tennis. So yeah, there must be a little bit of niggle, a bit of a nudge between the two of them and opposite ends of the personality spectrum. Even though you wouldn't believe it on court, they tend to act fairly similar on court, I think in a lot of ways, just given how fiery they are. But away from the court, I think they're very different personalities. That's the match. You got tennis Johnny Bravo basically and Fernando Verdasco, like barrel chested, <laughs> uh, unloading forehands at every second that he can. And, and his movement is probably not a plus against still pirate look rocking Rafa Nadal, who is on the cusp of not, of maybe solidifying his, his status as the best in the game or one of the best on all surfaces, because at this point, we're still. Still questioning the ability on the hard court, but there we are. It's for, it's Nadal, it's for Dasco, Australian Open semi-final right after the break. We enter the match, Bush, the first set. Best description is obscenely long rallies that have no place on a hard court. <laughs> in any era, in my opinion. Definitely, yeah. Um, but I think I think Jerry touched on it well, just in the basis that this match is, is pretty much on the hands, it's in, in the hands of how Fernando Dasco plays, which I know is absurd given, uh, I think it's actually a little disrespectful to say that given who Rafael Nadal is on the opposite end of the court. And I think we downplay sometimes what he does in a match, that when you have someone who is hitting winners past him, Nadal is still hitting absurd shots and he's still playing at a level that is above just about anyone else in the world. It's just, it's taking a superhuman effort to hit him off a court. But yeah, the, the slow court does make for some very interesting rallies. I am curious to see what everyone else on the podcast thinks about this. I didn't enjoy a whole lot of some of these rallies, I have to say. As, as fun as it is to see big, huge winners, it, it can be a little bit of a grind watching uh, watching just side to side hitting before someone eventually hits up that that finishing uh, that finishing winner. So I, I enjoyed many parts of this match and there were some absolutely ridiculous shots through this whole thing, but it's not, it's not a style of tennis which I'm particularly um, a fan of, I have to say. And I'm curious to see whether or not that resonates with anyone else. I think I get what you're saying in the sense that you like to see the risks of aggressive tennis be rewarded. And I think just the court surface just neutralized so much of that. So you get some kind of weird patterns of play where shots that would set up a winner or would be a winner in and of themselves just end up kind of continuing the point as if it was just, you know, pace hit into the middle of the court. So there's something kind of surreal about that. But I have to say, I did still really enjoy <laughs> seeing them have to raise the stakes constantly to, to, to get that winner. I think the, the the interesting angle to me was you're, you're looking at a Verdasco who's is pretty much a finished product. Like I know he plays for many years after this, but this is pretty much the Verdasco at, at his peak, I would say. Like he looks complete. The strokes look super smooth. Everything about his game looks uh, well managed and well composed and, and honed and practiced. And, and, and you look at a, a Rafa Nadal who there are still still some parts of his game that you can see him, himself growing into and especially on the hard court where that maybe that comfort isn't there and I think that juxtaposition of a, a maybe an unsure Nadal which I, I don't think it's fair to say obviously because you watch this kid out or out maneuver and out slug 
veteran players all the time at this age, but it does look like he's a bit unsure of himself compared to the, the Rafa that we've gotten so used to. So that made for extremely captivating viewing. But I mean, I, to, to, there's something hilarious about watching Fernando Verdasco just unload for five hours <laughs> with, with little regard for if the line is within reach or in the vicinity or maybe attainable. It's just like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going. I'm going with it. And this might be a little hyperbolic, but I honestly couldn't think of that many candidates that would match. Like this level of forehand over the course of a match might be as good as I've seen, like non Federer, non Nadal division. No, and I think tactically as well, it's one of those matches where he does, he does, uh, being Vadasco, does play in. He, he does cause Nadal problems in a lot of ways. That forehand into the backhand side. He is able to do it with that left-handed shot that often players can't do on the tour. And Nadal makes a living against right-handed players of just finding angles which puts them in difficult positions. doesn't really have that luxury against Vadasco. It is neutralized to a certain extent. And you can see it as well, just how much time Vadasco tries pinning Nadal into the backhand corner. It's quite hilarious, actually, just watching the course <laughs> of a rally of just pinning it over and over and over again, which is... It's probably Nadal's best shot, I would argue. Uh, I mean, his forehand's ridiculous, but it is it is also very funny watching it just repeatedly go to that side. And to the to the point that you were making before, we tend to forget Nadal's still really young here. We talk about Vadasco being young. I think they're 22 and 23 around this age. But Nadal's so good so early in his career, just ridiculously good, that we tend to forget that there is still a lot for him to grow into. I think he becomes a much better player throughout the rest of his career, which is absurd. I mean, he I think he's... Now, the best version of himself, just given what he is as an all-court player, uh, I think he hits a lot bigger now than he did when he's when he's around this age. He's a lot, a lot less defensive, I would say, in 2020 than he is here in 2009, but it makes for a really interesting match. I got, I got very nostalgic looking at the the tournament draw of the 2009 Australian Open, and, and just to list some names, the quarterfinalists, Nadal, Jill, Simon, Verdasco, Sanga, Roddick, Djokovic, that infamous Djokovic retirement against Roddick. <laughs> By the way, this is going to be released a bit after, but Andy Roddick going in on Novak Djokovic on Tennis Channel the other day. <laughs> Class. Perfect. <laughs> Amazing stuff. And then Del Potro Federer. Like, this is, you know, 2009. I know the big three, obviously. Big three, big four, et cetera, et cetera. Like this, these are the guys, and rightfully so. But I would like to throw my hands up for the other dudes that made this era, this era of tennis, which I think as Geary alluded to, like when, as we get into 2011, 2012, like we're talking peak, peak of a lot of these guys' careers, Bush. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the fact that you didn't go over what I had in my notes about uh, Novak Djokovic. Did you see the comment that I wrote? I did. No, we'll get to it. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Sher- Shervin, Shervin 333 is getting a wild card into the French <laughs> Open at this rate. So. <laughs> Very good. No, I think you're right. I think the, um, there is, we talk about the lost generation, right, of players who, who came up and uh, we didn't have a winner um, in the 90s and born in the 90s at Grand Slam level. I think I'm accurate in that. I think Chilich is in the 89. So I don't think yeah, we had that, right? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty absurd watching a who's who in that era, not, you know, we don't give them the celebration sometimes that they deserve. There's some credible players here and players that in different generations probably would be Grand Slam winners outside of who these big four are and having to come against the greatest players who have ever played in the sport. So, yeah, I think you're right. It is, yeah, it is, uh, it's a shame, actually. They don't tend to get the, the credit they deserve. Tie breaks massive in this this match. We go to three of them in the first set. Nadal is serving at 4-3 when Fernando Verdasco, as he often did in this set and throughout the match, caught fire with some absolutely ridiculous shot making. I think Geary overall, like Fernando Verdasco, we talked about the forehand. He is the guy, if you go to YouTube, like you search Verdasco forehand, you'll get some good clips, which you can't say that for everyone. But watching him, what is your, your biggest takeaway from him? Because I think one dimensional is not fair, but it's pretty clear. Like if it's working, if everything's connecting, he has everything available to him. Yeah. I think it was, it was a surreal reminder of how versatile his game is. Like he's doing so many different things with the forehand, even within this first or second set, he's, he's taking it, he's seeing the ball incredibly well on the returns. He's always ripping flat balls. He's got a really nice cross court angle where he hooks around the side of the ball and, produces angles inside the service box, um, you know, yanking it all off of the baseline. And then later in the match, he gets 
maybe out of desperation or whatever, he, he's even you know taking a ball out of the air with a swinging volley with his forehand. It's it's just a ridiculous shot when everything's working for him. And uh, obviously, he gives up a little bit in terms of movement with respect to it all, as do most humans ever. But he was seeing the ball well enough that I just think he was, you know, what he lacks in that first step. He the quality of ball striking was just ridiculous. I think there is a certain amount of this as well, which is it doesn't get spoken of. And it's it's an area of tennis which doesn't get covered a huge amount, just given there is so much smoke and mirrors around it. But Fernando Vadasco is a is a serial racket changer, someone who has been through many different brands, many different rackets, many different setups in terms of strings, in terms of swing weight, in terms of everything that gets put into his hand. I was reading an article the other day which talked about how he's probably been through about 10 or 11 different setups throughout his entire career. When you're talking about some of the top players, you you saw headline articles when Roger Federer changed his racket a single time a few years ago when he went to a bigger frame head. (laughs) And it's, it's it's one of those areas that I think we can probably do a better, better job in general of talking about how it does change the way that you play. And I know all of these top players play with a, a similar sort of swing weight and similar kind of racket style. But when someone is when is someone is fiddling around as much as someone is with a racket design or um, overall setup of a racket, it tends to ind- indicate that not all is well in the camp. And sometimes someone's blaming the tools a little more than they are themselves. And I, I think there maybe is an element of that with Fernando Vadasco throughout his career. He runs off those points at the end of the tie break, grabs the first set. I think the crowd is generally stunned. You have some people going over to the Verdasco side, and then you get the, the famous five hand gesture from his coach signaling to Verdasco that it's on, or this is possible. Bush, did you understand what the five meant? <laughs> I I wasn't sure what that was in reference to. I assume it wasn't in reference to the uh, British pop group Five of the nineties, but I suspect. <laughs> I <don't>, <laughs> is that is that Westlife area? Is that Westlife like time, or is that? It is. I'm actually quite amazed that you know who that is. So I'm, uh, I'm really, really impressed. It's a dark, it's a dark history. I don't want to dive into about my love for Britpop, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I love, I love the, uh, I love the five. But I also love how it could mean, hey, you have a five out of ten chance of winning this match still. Cause <laughs> what a terrible not coaching go, strategy. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to go away easy. He's not going to go away easy. But it is for a set for Dasco. Not many people would have given him a chance of doing this. Fernando Verdasco has probably played the best set of tennis of his life there. And he's got the first set over the number one seed. We move on to the second set. And surprise, surprise, it's a long rally still. I I would say, I I think talking about problem solving a lot in matches and, and tactical setups and it's it's finding out solutions to what's going wrong and, and Geary I think we, you're, you're looking at an Nadal in the second set who is still basically problem solving and, and not looking as as sure of himself as he definitely had throughout the tournament when it was a it was a cakewalk this is the first obstacle he's faced really this this two-week period yeah and I think it's something that's jumped out at me even watching the second set is what Simon touched on earlier is, you know maybe the, the depth and the consistent depth in the in the ball striking isn't quite there yet. Something he grew into over time, especially on hard courts. So you're seeing the ball come a little short on a lot of these long rallies, and you're seeing Verdasco, you know, take time away from him that just doesn't really happen anymore with with the spin and pace that Rafa has right now. So I think the fact that maybe even these tools weren't fully available to Rafa and his athleticism and movement takes him so far. Um, to me, that explains in part why this match kind of went as long as it did. And, and uh, through these first few sets, as they were kind of feeling each other out. I think that's absolutely right. I think there's a, an element that doesn't, doesn't get talked about at off, uh, often when you look at Nadal on hardcore at this point in his career. There's a very big difference, I think, between watching Nadal on return of serve versus Nadal on serve. I think he's a lot more aggressive on his first on his when he's on serve. He's a lot closer to the baseline. His first opening strike on that third ball is a lot bigger and he tries to hit a, a much more aggressive shot than he does when he's returning serve. Partly that's during the fact that he's, you know, standing in the flower beds. He's standing over by the <laughs> Wolf Blast slash Kia slash whoever is sponsoring the Australian <laughs> Open sign at the back of the court at this point. But I think there is there is a, a, a immense difference between how he 
how and I think you're right actually I think this has changed a bit in terms of how he's developed on a hard court throughout his entire career I don't think he stands as far back now certainly not at all on a hard court at this point and maybe there's a sense that he's still he wasn't the returner of server that he, that he is now he's grown into that as well at a certain point but he isn't standing 25 feet behind the baseline. I, I need to actually work out how many feet behind the baseline he is because it seems to change every week <laughs> when we talk about him. Some weeks it's 10, some weeks it's 40, some weeks it's <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to go out there and actually measure it at some point. Everyone everyone has imprinted in their mind how far they think Nadal stands behind the baseline. And some people believe it's kilometers. It's not actually on the court anymore. <laughs> but it's the... It's the Giri mentioned this, but I think, you know, Verdasco's forehand is exceptional, but there is variety and variation that he adds to it. And the angles he's creating, I think, made Nadal even less certain of his court positioning in terms of where he was standing. And I I, I mean, the Verdasco thing, there's power, obviously, but some of these angles that he was unleashing were, were mind boggling. And we're, we're, we're riding along in the second set. We're on serve. Verdasco is staying to say in the set. It's a, it's a game that he is he's not doing well in. It's, it's a should be a comfortable 40-15 situation, but Nadal manages to run off four points in a row. We get back to Deuce. And then probably the point of the match, the point of this set for sure, a point that was not included in the official Australian Open highlight pack of this <laughs> match, which I cannot, I, you know, I, I don't leave YouTube comments. I try not to. I don't think it does anyone really any good. But a part of me is like, what the, why would you not include this? Why would you not include this point? It's the point of the match, Bush, and it's probably one of the best shots Raf has ever hit in his life. It's in my eyes, is the best shot Nadal's ever hit in his career. I, I genuinely believe that. I genuinely also believe that this may be the best point that he's ever constructed. Well, he's he's so far... In in a nutshell, this is for Nadal at this point in time. Mm -hmm. He is dead to rights at so many points during this rally and somehow wins it with an absolutely ridiculous forehand that I just... I It boggles my mind that someone is able to do what he does at this point in time. And if you, if you want to take away one thing from this podcast, it's go go and check out this rally. Go and check out the point that he wins here because Verdasco is is stunned. He is shook, to use the, the modern lingo for it. <laughs> Verdasco <laughs> breaks out like a modified slash when he's really close to the net. So I'm like, that is some innovative stuff that is just easily returned by Nadal. I'm like, I've never seen that. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, not so. a while Absolutely back. Not so. A while back, I was trying to write a short piece about the Rafael Nadal, you know, on the run banana forehand, just curving around the sideline. And to me, this is just the canonical example of that. Maybe the best one he's ever hit. Maybe the best shot he's hit in his career. And it's also I have to remind myself, Verdasco hits such a good slice to drag him that far off the court in the first place. Mm -hmm. And he just, that he pulled that off is just ridiculous. Verdasco uses that slice pretty nicely in a few points through the match, but I've found that Rafa handled it really nicely each time. You get the Verdasco smile at the big screen, you get the crowd eruption, or even a set of piece. We're going to a third set where now Nadal is looking like this is going to be his chance. Rally of the tournament, for sure. I'm great that he can smile. We move to the third set. I mentioned, we have all mentioned the slow court, and it, it's, uh, you can tell right away because you can tell by the, the lettering at the back of the court in Melbourne when it was it was different, obviously. And I think when they changed the court, obviously they changed some of some aspects of the layout. But the lettering, the backdrop, there's a there's a Kia logo and then some mining consortium in the back bush, as you mentioned. I don't know who was sponsoring <laughs> what in Australia at that time, but all those things bring <laughs> back to when what, what I to be honest, the, the slowness of the courts was interesting and I, I'm glad they changed it, but it does help someone like Verdasco, maybe, who is his movement is not a strength. And, and I think the ball striking as well. Is that something, maybe, Geary, that you can, can see being aided by the court here? Because I thought Verdasco, even though I think physically he started to drop, his ball striking was on the same level throughout. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, I just think some of the core positioning he was able to maintain over the course of this match would not at all be possible on a faster court. 
Um, I just remember seeing him for long stretches, just being comfortably inside the baseline, which doesn't really make sense given the quality of hitting on the other side of the court. Um, but th- this set was one of my favorites just because of the breaks and the break backs. And I just think when Verdasco's breaking back in both of those games, it's just some of the best hitting of the entire match. Simon on the record stating Verdasco's forehand should be illegal. Do you stand by that? <laughs> I do. He, he's just, I used it in the notes and you mentioned it. I just think he's so smooth. It's just such a, he looks like a well-oiled machine. And some players, you look like they're physically struggling to produce power and they're struggling to, you know, crank out 130 miles an hour serves. It just looks so easy for him. And I think it's one of those things that we always try and strive for when we when we try and get better at any skill is just to make it look like it's effortless. And he really does. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch when he's in full swing. His forehand is, is absurd throughout this match. And this third set has some very good energy in it. The breaks of serve certainly help with it. The momentum swinging back and forth inside of it. And it has everything. I think the first two sets are, are on a knife edge. They're, they're decided by a few points here and there. And it really is like to the wire of who's going to take and who's going to take those sets. This one's a bit more all over the place. And it's one of those that anyone could take it and change the direction of the match. It's, it's a different set as well. You guys mentioned there's, there's a lot of breaks. There's a lot of seemingly critical points coming every few minutes not not long stretches of uh holds of serve it's it's nerve-wracking it's back and forth i think verdasco's belief and we talk about a lot in tennis and it's definitely not everything with the mental aspect of actually believing you can do this it can't be very high for verdasco at certain points in this third set but i think that was that's what impressed me most among many things about uh fernando verdasco from this match because i think there's there's a lot of reasons why you would you would see Someone in his position maybe fade away after he loses that second set and, and he sees an Adal who is feeling more confident, but he didn't. And and we're talking about Verdasco's forehand. I wonder if it's it's something about this generation as well, right? I can think of a lot of guys who had singularly beautiful strokes that maybe weren't able to put it together and become superstars or Grand Slam winners, mm-hmm. but guys who hit the ball really freaking nicely. Like Richard Gasquet, who hits the ball better than that? But he doesn't win a lot of big titles, right? So, like, what's what's the, the trade-off here? <laughs> yeah, that got me thinking. Just watching uh, Verdasco, that smoothness that you guys talk about. Who else was playing like that at that time? It, it almost made me think of Safin a little bit. Just how how cleanly everything's working from the baseline. I think that's an excellent comparison. I really do. I think that they have very, very similar games in terms of how they strike the ball, in terms of their position on court. Safin a little bit bigger, maybe a bit more. Um, a bit more power off the first serve, perhaps. Uh, and maybe maybe a little better tactically, I would say, in some ways. I think just the fact yeah. that he is, you know, 6'4 and, and lumbering and a bit of a bear sometimes. People tend to forget how smart he was in a tennis court. I, I'm not convinced I would call Vidasco a uh, a savant on a tennis court, I have to say. I think he <laughs> he knows one speed. No, um, no, that's works fair. for him quite that's a lot fair. of the time. <laughs> I'm not. I won't. I won't uh, <laughs> destroy the the beautiful house that Gasquet built. That I know you are a, a paying member of that museum, Bush, and I know that was sacrilege to mention his name alongside <laughs> Verdasco. But you know, Gasquet played Fernando <laughs> Gonzalez in this tournament at twelve ten to five setter, which is amazing. Fed took out Safin in the third round. Just a who's who. An amazing list of players. Dennis Istomin is kicking around at this point. He's still wow. playing on challenger events like this. Is Radek Stefanik is here? Jurgen Meltzer is here. It's uh, it's a throwback and a correction. I, I said it was Olivier Rockus that Rafa beat in the first round, but it was his brother, the infamous Rockus Bros. It was Chris, Christoph uh-huh. who he beat. Ra- yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's just a really nostalgic t- trip down memory lane. Even though this was only eleven years ago, but we're back to the match. It's in the tiebreak, in which you know I, I think. Uh, Cleanness wise and, and Nadal setting settling into a match. This is probably the best he looks, Bush. At the end of this third set, you have to feel really confident if you're in his camp. I think so. He plays a, a really good tiebreaker. Very, very clean tiebreaker. Uh gives gives Vodasco very few opportunities. And I think he he tightens up when he needs to here and and does what he does, which is find ways to win big points. And the energy is really high in the stadium. Uh the crowd is is uh, split, I would say. Do you think that's fair, actually? I mean, my perception of watching this match is I thought it was a little, little more on Nadal's side, but I think the, the crowd got into it a bit more and it looked like Vadasco might win this match. 
I think it's still it's still leaning towards Rafa, but this is it, Rafa's definitely not as as uh, boisterous as as we see him or see him at times. I think there is a tentative a tentative this year where maybe there is that friendship countryman aspect. Maybe there are boys where he's he's feeling nervous about something. But I do think the crowd is a little more split than I was expecting. That's that's for sure. I mean, Rafa at this point is already a, a mega star on the global stage, but he is also probably not as popular as Roger is, right? Like not you not at this point, and you could argue yeah. maybe. They're not the same level not right now, but definitely at that point, I think, you know, Roger is still the guy guy and, and maybe Rafa is seen as an interloper and the crowd who's always been very pro Roger in Melbourne might be sensing that as well because that's who's waiting in the final. It's Roger Federer and these guys are playing the second semi. So the longer this goes and the commentators make mention of it several times, they're, they're saying Roger's <laughs> got to love this in his hotel room and all of us in this podcast room today know that he wasn't loving this. He didn't want to see Rafa in that <laughs> final. He would have <laughs> gladly taken Fernando Verdasco in that final. <laughs> One thing that also struck me at this time, just given how you know stoic and in control Rafa is now, is that you actually see more frequent signs of him getting down on himself or showing frustration or you know looking at his racket. Uh, that I, I think all that kind of leveled out over time. Well, one is he just got insanely good, but also as he kind of maintained a perfect composure over time as well. Bush, Bush, do you think? Remember, you you mentioned this before, but the fact that Nadal takes it as like a personal affront that someone is even competing against him because the idea is that this person <laughs> is trying to take my job or he's trying to take me out of that spot. Do you think that feeling is there yet for Nadal, or that's something that he developed later on? Because I didn't get that vibe. I don't know that that's the emotion, at least my my reading of him and, and some of the things that he's read. I think there's a perhaps a little more, I think the way you described it is a bit more aggressive. I think he, this is my reading, so feel free to call me full of nonsense and everything. This is at least my perspective on it, is that Nadal is, a, is, a very, is an introverted person um, at heart and someone who does lack for self-confidence. Um, and he's talked about this in interviews uh, in the past. And I think sometimes that when people ask, where does that fire come from in a lot of ways? I think my reading of it is this, that he strives every day to be the best version of himself when he's on a tennis court. And no matter who he plays against, he always has this belief that the other player can beat him. And he needs to play at the top level all the time because no matter who he stands on a court against, they are capable of beating him. And that's where he has and where he is in, in his head. And this is just my reading and, you, and whatever, and you can have an interpretation of it. But that, that is at least the perception that I've always had about him, which is the fact that it forces him to play everyone at their level, um, regardless of who they are, to play them at their merit and try and crush them, which I think... A lot of players don't do, and I think it's a it's a it's a differentiating factor for players of how they look at it mentally. Like some players will strive on court and be like, "I'm better than this person, regardless of who it is. I deserve to win, and I can use you know stick my chest out and beat someone." I don't think that's him, and I've never thought that that was how he approached a, a tennis match. I think it's always this person is a in Nadal's head. This person is a excellent professional who is a very good tennis player and they have every opportunity to beat me here and I have to play my best. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. And you know, for 99.99% of the tour, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> like That's a ridiculous way of thinking about things because it's absolutely absurd. But that's at least the, the viewing I've always had of it. And I, I'm curious to know whether or not people other than myself have that reading of him. I think that's an accurate reading. Another thing that sort of connects to that is that I think players at that level like Federer and Nadal can sometimes you know be chafed by a player who's redlining and maybe someone who is playing at the very outer limits of their ability or or doing things that they don't think are quote unquote you know playing the right way and what one thing that kind of pops into my mind is more recently is is just Nadal's visceral reaction to Kyrgios in Acapulco <laughs> last so, year. Soderling as well. <laughs> yeah, Soderling as well, right? Yeah. For sure. Soderling's a great example. And then I think also about Federer, and I think it was the 2011 US Open, talking about that one return, just total go-for-broke return mm-hmm. that Djokovic had on him. And he, he kind of disrespected that shot after, after the match. Mm-hmm. So I think there is something about this kind of player that, that just rubs them the wrong way. 
we get another vintage Nadal point, possibly the second greatest point of his career somehow, and it's in the same match. It's a rally at 3-4, game point to Nadal. Another two smashes from Verdasco that should have won the point. Another two returns. Somehow, a passing shot is also produced from Nadal. It's an incredible clip, <laughs> and the reaction of the crowd is equally amazing. on their feet he, he did two pirouettes Patrick in that point Vidasco Vidasco hits that smash when he's basically on his knees as well as he's yeah. at the net <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> he hits like a badminton shot when he's at the net <laughs> it's a ridiculous ridiculous point a point that I think along with a couple others really did a good job of capturing how wild this match was but it's it's a, another example, you know, again, now the crowd is super amped. Now it's like, all right, Rafa, finish this. Let's go. Let's get this date with Roger in the final. Let's see what happened at Wimbledon happened again, but this time in Melbourne. But no, like, Verdasco doesn't go away. He unleashes a ridiculous drop shot the game after, which I thought was very out of character, it seemed, at that time in the match. And then we get to another tiebreak where it's literally all Verdasco all the time. Gary, you talked about redlining. This is one of the better tiebreaks I've ever seen. And it's at this stage of a Grand Slam semifinal against Rafa Nadal it's absolutely ridiculous it's you know Rafa seven points from getting into a Grand Slam final he's generally pretty motivated in that situation and he runs up the score 6-0 on him and it's it's just ridiculous Uh, he's playing so clean he's getting to the net um I think he finally uh it reaches the limit of his redlining in that 6-0 point where he, I think he tries to rip a return and hits it out of the stadium or something. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Up, 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 in, up until that point, it's it's the, as high as he level as he's played in his life. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't think it's unfair to say that those six points are probably the best points he's ever played in his life consecutively. It's a it is a standard of tennis which is well worth watching. And I said, go back and, and watch that point in the second set, which I think is amazing. Do yourself a favor and watch this tiebreak as well if you want to see just a level of tennis, which is truly, truly absurd. It made sense he had to cool down his racket in that seven point by hitting a ball out of the stadium because it was overheating <laughs> from the gas that was provided. So there we are. It's two sets of piece. It's a trip to the final on the line in the fifth set coming up right after the break. Welcome back to the Open Era podcast. We enter the fifth set of the 2009 Australian Open semifinal where there are no tie breaks. No tie breaks at that time was strictly an Australian Open thing. I I really remember well, uh, I don't know about you guys. Do you remember Yunus Elanawi and Andy Roddick had a a marathon match at the Aussie Open? Who can forget the visor? <laughs> <laughs> and what what struck me about that match is because it, was, it was super long, but it's it's at uh, that time I'm I'm, a, I'm pretty young and I obviously know what temperature is, but didn't really have an idea of how how hot it was in Melbourne or how hot it was in Australia in general. But by the level of sweat that Andy Roddick was producing, it seemed pretty damn hot. And that was a, a guide into what the conditions could be like when matches go super deep. And for a guy that looked like he was dying in the fourth set, Verdasco didn't look much better, I thought, in the fifth set physically, even <laughs> though he was still managing to play well, Bush. Yeah, and uh, who knows at this point in a career, Fernando Verdasco is known for a certain lifestyle off the court in, in some capacity. And, and who knows who knows much how much of that is actually true in terms of some of the junk that gets reported about players but i don't know smoke without fire sometimes on these things maybe he does uh, enjoy a little bit of the bottle and a little of the lifestyle of the court <laughs> <court. laughs> I, th- I think that that the adidas the adidas crew at that time was like the the brat pack uh, like Leo DiCaprio crew, um, Holly, like that. This is what like the Adidas, the Adidas crew at that time apparently, like from the stories you hear. So I guess that's why where this just there was this innuendo, but it's like 
Should he pay more attention to tennis? I don't know. But at this point in the fifth set, it is a weird contrast of someone who looks physically like they are stretched, but also the, the shot making is still there. He's still in the match, but you can see the wheels fall off a bit. And, and Giri, you get towards maybe the those those big moments uh, at 4-4 in the, the fifth. The thing about the fifth set that I have in glaring font in my notes is that I, I had to rewatch this. He's serving 137 miles an hour five hours into this match. And, you know, he's staving off break points with absolutely insane serving this deep into the match. And, you know, you, you definitely see his legs starting to go. He, he's getting those massages. His his hair, however, is as wet and as rigid as it was in the very first <laughs> point of the match. <laughs> so at least that has stayed the same. But it, 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 it is at 4-4, four, four, that's probably – his best look at the match right there. He opens it up to left 30 with some huge hitting on the returns. And then he gives it back with two, two gifts of unforced errors. And then Rafa closes out from there, but that's an incredibly dramatic point of the match. I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up, Gary, because it, it's uh, one thing that I wanted to get to. And the tennis can wait for a second. Cause I think there are important things to discuss here. Fernando Vadasco <laughs> and his hair. Okay. Stay with me. <laughs> Next time you go to your barber and you need, you can see those like portrait pictures hanging on the wall, <laughs> him and his hair looks like it should just be placed in, in, I in told a barber. You, like, I, I, I told you he's tennis Johnny Bravo, but they, they probably, <laughs> the stuff they use to patch up Chernobyl and those reactors is the stuff that's in his hair, his product, I'm assuming, based on the toughness. Because Yuri is correct, it is not an exaggeration. There is no movement there. It is not possible to have no movement in a, in a hair like that through the, the sweat that's developed. I just... You know, sometimes you you look for answers, but I couldn't find any to explain that. <laughs> yeah, and it's got to be demoralizing for Nadal on the other side of the court, right? With the thinning hair. You know, it's got to be something that gets into his mind a little bit. <laughs> it's it's a perfect snapshot of that decade in hair as well. It's Just true. Like- it's true. I, I have some questions. What's Rafa going to do with his hair wise? Because it's, it's, he's getting into some interesting territory with... Uh, with the hairline feds getting into some interesting territory. I didn't know it was like these guys, these guys on the hair crew, they're losing it. I've been pushing for a bald Rafa for a while. I think it would be a very intimidating. Look. You know, you know, we, we always wanted him to go the full Agassi without the crystal meth. And I think this is the closest yeah. to that is, is him shaving his head, but it's, 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 Verdasco serving at 4-5. He falls behind Love 40 to set up three pan- match points for Nadal. Who saves two with two typically hilariously audacious shots that connect only to double fault. And that's the match. Uh, Rafael Nadal wins his first Grand Slam on a hard court in Melbourne. Oh, no. Oh. Both players falling to the ground. One in absolute... Disbelief. The other one in relief. The great friends. The rivalry that they've had for more than five hours past the site. Bush post match. It, it sucks that it ended on a double fault, but you know, you always see the winner collapse in a moment like this. I appreciated that Fernando also collapsed when he double faulted. Like, All right, I'm done. I'm done. This is it. This is it. <laughs> It kind of looks like the, you know, when the football player dives. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like, did you get the license plate levels of someone over dramatically falling to the ground? And uh, I think it is very poignant that Gary sighed talking about the double fault, because that's kind of how I felt. Even watching the highlights back, it's just like, ah, come on, dude, you are so close. Just to lose it like this, it is uh, it is devastating and it's it's heartbreaking. I have, you know, I'm not a huge Vadasco fan and some of the things... Uh, around him but you know you do feel for the guy who's put absolutely every, everything into this match he's never going to play better the dude has 95 winners 95 winners in the match and doesn't win it I mean it's testament to what Nadal is as a defensive player but goodness me you've got to be devastated if you've a at the end of this match and if you go back and look at the first point of that last game it's about as good a point as you'll see in any Grand Slam final. And it, again, it's happening five hours into this match, which is just <laughs> ridiculous. But I think lo- losing that one is probably around the point where his soul just began to leave his body. And then <laughs> the double fault was just the last wisps of that escaping into, into the air. 
you feel like if you have someone who is uh, skilled with um, Photoshop or Visual Studio or something, you can, and uh, you can, uh, or Final Cut Pro, sorry, you can do uh, uh, Chief Wiggum, not Chief Wiggum, uh, uh, Ralph Wiggum. You, <laughs> you, you, you pinpoint the moment of heartbreaks situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, f- you fell into my trap of referring to well known characters differently. Like, no one calls Ralph Wiggum Chief Wiggum's son, but it sounds super weird when you do. I like that. This was it for Fernando Verdasco. I don't mean it, and I, I mentioned this off the top. It's not like he stopped playing tennis forever after this, but <laughs> this is, he made the quarterfinal at U.S. Open that year and made the quarters at the U.S. Open the next year and the quarters at Wimbledon in 2013, but that's, this is the farthest he ever got at a Grand Slam, and it's got to be tough to realize, hey, sure, maybe Roger would have beat him in the final, probably. I'm assuming fitness-wise, he would not have recovered as well as, as Rafa did, but... Obviously, a case of what ifs. Rafa, very emotional after the match. Quote, in the last game at Love 40, I started to cry. It was too much tension. Fernando was playing, I think, at his best level. He deserved this final, too. It was the longest match in Australian Open history at that time, of course, passed by a match we've covered in the past, the Nadal Djokovic epic from 2013. The Australian Open... Uh, calmer heads prevailed, sanity prevailed, and they installed the quicker court, which I think has then made it our favorite slam collectively. Though, Geary, I'm curious, what is your favorite slam? And if you had to rank them, rank them right now. Uh, well, I probably have the most direct physical connection to the USO just because I'm there all the time. But as an overall viewing experience, I think it's, yeah, AO is first for me. There's something perversely fun about me staying up all night here on the East Coast to watch it as well. And then I'd probably put Wimbledon in and then USO and then RG last. But again, that's probably some PTSD as a Fed fan. <laughs> we know what happened in the final. It was a, a great final, obviously. We talk about that match as well. I, I still think this this semifinal was the best match of the tournament on the men's side and, and, and better than that final, even though that was great as well. But we all remember that for Roger's tears afterwards. He was trying to tie Pete Sampras for all time. Roger was on 13 Grand Slams. That doesn't seem like it was 11 years ago. It feels like 30, possibly, because... Those are some interesting times. You know, Roger is crying and, and we, all, we understand, you know, it's like, damn, like he wanted to win that final. But you have to imagine a part of him was like, is this it for me as the king of this game? Because French Open's one thing. Clay is one thing. And sure, he, he got the Wimbledon. But if if Roger's reign on the hard courts is over too, maybe it's it's all Nadal going forward from 2009. So I, I wonder how much that played into the emotional uh, scene that we saw from Fed Bush. Yeah, without a doubt, right? Like he's... Uh he's been surpassed at this point right and i think it's it's uh he said himself in multiple documentaries that he didn't want a rival he didn't want he wanted to be he liked being the best player in the world it's he enjoyed cool, it right? and it's who pretty doesn't slick. it's pretty <laughs> slick people are like this this cat does not sweat and plays beautiful tennis what else do i need they don't need rivals <laughs> no and i think it's testament it's looking back right i think that 2000 uh, and we tend in, in a lot of ways we tend to forget that nadal doesn't I mean, he has a great record, of course. Anyone would be proud to get to the number of finals that he has in in Australia. But it is Nadal's solitary win in Australia. He has only done it once. He's been the final four times, five times, I believe. So he, it's a it's a place that, by the standards of how great this player is, he doesn't have the best track records of converting them into wins. Not least, I mentioned in 2016, he lost in round one and he lost to Fernando de Vadasco. Like that is a, a match which um, we didn't think we would uh, see again. And Vadasco raised his level again and, and played really well in that in, in that first round match to beat him. I do think it's it's funny looking back at this point in time is that we thought Vadasco was on the upward trajectory and I remember very distinctly watching them for some bizarre reason. This one stuck in my memory. I watching Monte Carlo in 2010, the following year on clay. Cause I thought, okay, Vadasco is, he's with it now. Like he's, he's fully committed to it. He's played Nadal tough before. He's going to give him a really good final. And he just got leveled, just completely and utterly pummeled to the limits that anyone's ever been pummeled on a professional tennis court. And it's kind of that way, right? Like I think Nadal uses this as a, as a springboard in a lot of ways to, become a much better player. And I think this is this pivotal point in their careers where Nadal goes one way and kicks on and Fernando Vadasco just kind of stays who he is, which is a top 50 player who makes it to third and fourth rounds of Grand Slams, but never converts to anything more than that. And there is nothing wrong with that. I think most of us who ever pick up a tennis racket would dream 
of a, of a great career where you're top 50 in the world. I think it would be, I think we'd all settle for that at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I agree. This is definitely a point where you can see the careers kind of diverge. I mean, this is the peak of Rodasco's career pretty clearly. It's very rare that you can look at someone's career in any field and just isolate a five hour chunk of it that was <laughs> yeah. the best this part. Is it. This is it. This is it. <laughs> it would have been amazing if if they could have told him that as it was happening, like, don't, don't, you better enjoy this. This is it. This is it, man. <laughs> and there was something like a little bit heartbreaking about watching it a decade later and realizing that he would never get anything near this again. But, you know, that that's kind of the player he is and maybe also the corresponding personality he is. And Rafa's a different build and it's not, it's no surprise they went in the two directions they did. To close the story, we mentioned how the tennis landscape looked very different during the trophy ceremony. Roger in tears, Rafa the champion, this is his tour now. We go to Paris in the French Open where some guy from Sweden named Robin Soderling beats Nadal in the fourth round. And what do you know? Roger Federer gets his one and only French Open to tie Pete Sampras to basically make it perfect. It's funny how quickly things can change in an instant. And then and Rafa, you know, we talk about, yeah, sure, Australia is one thing, but what about the U.S. Open? Well, he did that in a 2010 where he won three slams and where he beat Novak's Djokovic in the final <laughs> in New York. So it's it's a pretty wild time, man. I, 2009 to 2011 is an absolutely nutso time on the men's tour in, a, in an era, again, that will not be surpassed, I don't think, in, in any future generations it was a crazy time and there were so many flips i mean if if novak wins the french open in 2011 he's probably wins the calendar slam that year like it's there's a lot of things that could have happened uh at the turn of that decade that had a a major impact on what we see today but i still love this match a lot i think push to wrap up so it's a weird close because i think obviously things are still going for rafa and and i don't think he's done it 19 but we talked off the hop about maybe not appreciating him because he was Roger's rival and, and because we had a, a different look at his ascendance, someone to challenge our guy, the top guy. But I know myself, the appreciation has grown in leaps and bounds. It's a bit similar to how Agassi was for me, but I really have a good time watching Rafa in these days as well because it's, it's the evolution of this guy's game from the beginning to now. It's it's remarkable, and I don't think it's something we're going to see again. Is this a typically unique character that I, I just don't see how you can replicate this this kind of this kind of game bush well we've we've talked about it before just given some of the the retrospectives we've done since uh, covid has been around um just how certain players go through different eras and we talked about monica sellers being a, a good example of that someone who uh, at the start of her career was in one era and at the end of it she was in a very very different era and I think in a lot of ways Nadal if you look at him from 2003 all the way when he's a junior and he's still winning which is ridiculous at 15 or whatever it was and when he's going to play this year in 2020 they are vastly different players and we mentioned how different it is between 2009 and 2020 just in terms of who the players are and what they kind of uh, and what and how their games are sort of modeled on. He's an interesting one. I mean, just any time you're going to span 20 years of a, an entire career, you're, you're going to change. And I think the, the the tour has become a bit quicker in some ways. Like I know they've slowed the courts down, but the rackets have got a bit heavier. Uh, I think the ball striking is a lot better. It's a lot more athletic. Um, mm-hmm. You tend to see much more much more athletic players come onto the scene. There's much more of a focus done on on movement, and I think that's one thing that's uh, different in 2009 versus 2020. I think the players move differently and understand um, how to take care of their bodies a lot better, and it's just more, much more professional in general. So, I think he's a fascinating player just to look at how how his game has shifted and how he's managed to still win throughout 20 years of being on tour, and. I think he comes a little later than Federer in some ways, right? Federer, you can still see. You can, I think it's more stark in a lot of ways. You can watch Federer from 99 when he's a junior and then watch him in 2019 play. And you can see, okay, that's a very, very different player across those years. Nadal is, you can see elements of the same player last year or this year when you watch him play, but it's been a little more gradual across the whole across the whole career but it's a it's a fascinating one to look back at and one that we're going to be looking at for many years to come because i don't think he's going to stop anytime soon gary here your rafa thoughts 
Yeah, I think it's one of the very cool parts about watching a prodigy kind of grow up and develop in public. Whereas, you know, Federer maybe flipped the switch somewhere in his early 20s and then was kind of the same way from then on, more or less. But Rafa is, you know, picking up new tools, learning lessons from big matches. He's adapting to all the surfaces. And the reason we got to see all this happen is because he was absolutely ridiculous player as a teenager. And seeing this one snapshot somewhere in the middle of that journey is, was pretty cool. And like I said, I am a lot more keen on appreciating Rafa this time around than maybe I was the first time. So that's an added bonus as well. Before we go, guys, trivia, who did Rafa beat to win his first Grand Slam? Yeah, I know this one just because the name, shall I see if Gary can do it first before I, uh, before I reveal my stupid knowledge. I don't knowledge. think I know this one. Yeah. So I know it's Mariana Puerta simply because Puerta got banned. <laughs> so <I remember laughs> it's, it's true. Him. It's true. <laughs> the, he couldn't do what we asked him to do. We're like, you got to beat this kid. He's going to take over the tour and he failed us. So we had to get rid of him. That's what, that's what happened. But no, that, that's, that's an interesting story. It is Mariana Puerta. Well done, Bush. That's it. That's Rafael Nadal with an incredible match win against Fernando Verdasco at the 2009 Australian Open. A big thanks to Geary for joining us. Please come back again. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. You can find him at Geary Nathan on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter at OpenEraPod. Or if you want to email us, it's podcast at OpenEra.ca. We are also on Patreon, patreon.com slash OpenEra. For Geary, Simon, and myself, thank you as always for listening to the Open Air Podcast. We will talk to you soon.